Hello. Hello, everyone. I always do that uh, awkward start because I'm not quite sure when the camera turned on. I think they call that a millennial pause on TikTok, which I'm definitely guilty for. So, But hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's Software Development Career Workshop. Uh, we are going to kick off the event in just a minute here. In fact, I'm just going to get my presentation queued up on the side. Uh, before I do, I um, just want to make sure that uh, everybody can see me okay, everybody can hear me okay. Um, if that is the case, uh, feel free to go ahead and react. Give me a thumbs up. You can let me know in the chat bar on to the, the right-hand side. Awesome. I see some thumbs up coming through there. Perfect. Perfect. And then uh, I always uh, like to invite everyone to share uh, where they are joining us from. Uh, I personally am from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, I'm actually originally from Ontario. I'm from close to uh, Toronto and I've lived out in the Rockies. Now I live in, in uh, Calgary, Alberta. So been all over all over Canada, I guess, <laughs> three provinces, uh, Victoria, Victoria, BC, BC, Vancouver, Vancouver, just a ton of BC folks in here today, which is kind of what I was anticipating. This is uh, amazing. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the event. I'm going to get it kicked off in just a moment here. Um, before I do, um, I do want to, I'm going to actually go over the um, the space that we're in here. So there's the chat log off in the bottom right corner. Uh, obviously, you guys can see that. You're responding to me there, which is great. Uh, there's also a questions tab down there. Um, so if you have any questions for uh, myself or for today's speaker, uh, at the end of the event, we'll take those questions and we'll put them up and kind of answer them as a group. So if, if you do put anything in the questions tab and we uh, ignore it during the presentation, we're kind of doing it on purpose not to ignore you outright, but just because we want to answer them at the end. So, um, And then there's also polls tab there. I did drop a couple polls in in advance for this presentation. Uh, feel free to engage with those uh, at any time throughout the presentation as well. And then finally, I'm going to put a link in the chat right now. Um, so if anybody didn't get a chance to do this in advance, this link here is just going to take you right to the course page for the uh, course that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. So if anybody wants a copy of the syllabus, if they just want to look at the uh, course information, uh, or of course, if they're, they're looking to uh, apply or enroll in it, uh, all that uh, information is just through that link there. And if you do uh, request the uh, syllabus, it'll just get emailed to your inbox. Um, also, I should mention that this presentation today is also going to be fully recorded and emailed out to everybody's inbox after the event. So um, if you want to, you can take notes, you can take photos, you can take screenshots, or you can just sit back and relax and uh, you'll get a recording of the, the presentation afterwards as well. So, so without further ado, let me actually start the presentation. There we go. And put that bigger. We don't need me up here as big. Amazing. All right. So let me kick it off here. So I'll start off with an introduction uh, about myself. So uh, my name is Tyler, uh, Tyler Trapp. I've worked with CircuitStream uh, for just over two and a half years. I guess actually I'm going to be coming uh, through to my three year anniversary. Uh, leading into this summer, which is is crazy. It's just gone so fast. Uh, previous before this, I worked in travel and tourism for about 10, uh, 10 plus years or so, um, just in hotels and traveling all over the place, lots of conferences, a little bit of a different world than tech education. Um, I always joke and say that was my, my pre-COVID life, but uh, we will also have, I'm uh, not inviting her up on stage quite yet, but we will have uh, Christy Warwick joining us today. Uh, Christy is a software engineer at Google. Um, she's going to share some information about her story, about her current role at Google, um, and then some tips and advice for new uh, software developers. So before I invite her up, I'm going to officially start the presentation with a little bit of a brief overview of who we are here at CircuitStream. Uh, there we go. So CircuitStream began in 2015 through a network of developers, designers, and creators, and is now a leading provider of technology education in a few different spaces, in AR, VR, uh, game development and design, uh, software development, and also in product management. Uh, we partner with industry-leading companies and leading educational institutions to offer courses and training to those looking to learn more about emerging technologies. So see some of our partners up on the screen there. Um, and of course, like I said before, this will all be recorded and sent out to everybody. So. Um, in terms of software development, uh, why la launch a career in software development? Well, software developers uh, collaborate with project managers, designers, and end users to understand requirements and to translate them into functional software solutions. Uh, they are responsible for designing, coding, testing, and maintaining software applications and systems. Uh, the combination of intellectual challenge, creative expression, collaboration, and impact makes being a software developer a deeply fulfilling and rewarding profession. 
uh, on screen, you can see here some of the uh, top reasons why people would choose to work as software developers. Uh, acquiring software development skills in Canada position, positions individuals to excel in a variety of industries and contribute to economic growth. Um, the province of British Columbia alone, which uh, many of you folks are from, as I just learned, uh, there are over 51,000 developer and programmer jobs supported and over 11,000 companies in the industry just within that province. So a ton of opportunity there. Uh, and actually on that slide too, you can see some of the, the companies down at the bottom. Those are some of the, uh, the top companies hiring for software developers. Uh, there are also many different titles that software developers are hired for, including programmers, software engineers, uh, front-end, back-end developers. You can see a few examples there on the screen. Um, and then uh, some exciting information here. According to the BC Tech Association, there are over 15,000 job openings for software developers in just BC alone every year, and over 220,000 people directly employed in this province alone as well. So uh, it's a very booming industry. There's tons of opportunity. Uh, so if you are interested or looking uh, to get into software development and you are located in anywhere, but specifically if you're located in BC, it seems to be that uh, there's a ton of opportunity there. Um, in terms of our bootcamp, our, our hands-on 36-week software development bootcamp is both online and project-based, and it has five hours of live class per week. Um, it also has 2.5 hours of uh, technical and bi-weekly career labs and 10 hours of independent study. There are weekly assignments, in-class challenges, portfolio projects, and students complete a capstone project at the end of the bootcamp. Over the course of the 36 weeks, they require, they acquire skills that uh, master the craft of, de of developing advanced scalable software systems. I'm sorry, I'm tripping over my words today here, guys. I might need some water in a moment. Uh, scalable software systems, including leveraging modern AI tools to code faster and smarter. Uh, this foundational course is an excellent start starting point for those aiming to establish a career in software development, uh, offering an in-depth introduction to the industry's core practices and emerging trends. And again, uh, I, I mentioned it a few times just in case people kind of pop in and out of the presentation at any point, but uh, you will get all of this recorded, all of this information here about the course. Uh, our bootcamp graduates emerge with a comprehensive skill set that prepares them for success in the dynamic, dynamic field of software, de, de, ugh, software development. I am so sorry. I'm going to take water now before I keep tripping over my words, guys. There we go. Uh, through in-depth modules like software development foundations, students gain, gain the ability to conceptualize and create solutions to complex problems, uh, fostering critical thinking and analytical reasoning. Uh, graduates always are, uh, are also educated in areas like front-end development, full-stack integration, uh, system design and um, algorithmic thinking, AI-enhanced software development, and more, as you can see on the screen there. Uh, students receive career development and support um, as they complete this boot camp, and they also complete it with a software developer certification. So uh, speaking of career development and support, I'm going to uh, briefly invite uh, Wanai on stage. Wanai is a Circuit Stream Student Outcome Manager, and she's going to share a little bit of information on the career development and the support uh, offered through our boot camp. So welcome, Wanai. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, so all of our boot camps come with career support and guidance. The Circuit Stream Career Labs teach students how to leverage technical and behavioral strengths, gain awareness of the digital ecosystem, create compelling portfolios, elevate digital presence, learn how to network effectively, as well as become interview ready um, for industry jobs. Our career and networking support really sets our programs apart from uh, others that you may find. Um, because every, every student has different objectives coming in, but for those that are looking for new jobs or to improve their current positions, they really find this aspect of the course incredibly helpful. And as part of um, the career support, our boot camps also come with a student pitch day, which happens towards the end of the program. Students have the opportunity to showcase, uh, to showcase their capstone projects to hiring and industry partners. This event is an amazing way to add people to your network, be considered for any job openings that they may have, or to just receive feedback on your projects from hiring managers working in the industry. 
Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Wanai, for sharing information on the career support side. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Wanai, um, she'll probably be able to hang out in the uh, the chat here for a little bit. So uh, feel free to engage with her directly. You can ask any questions in the chat. But um, thank you, Wanai, for sharing the uh, the information on the career support for our boot camps. Perfect. So. Actually, before I flip to this side, I yeah, maybe I will. I'm going to uh, officially invite uh, today's guest speaker on stage now. Uh, so Christy uh, Warwick is a software engineer with a passion for building quality software and having fun doing it. Uh, during her career, she has worked on everything from currency exchange to AAA games. Uh, currently, she leads teams building continuous delivery tools at Google. So welcome, Christy. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, I have a couple of slides too. Uh, let me just see if I can share those sure i was telling christy last time that i love the background thanks <laughs> i've been thinking about just taking a picture of it so i can get it while it's all tidy and cleaned up and using that as my background <laughs> just uh, upload it as an image <laughs> yeah. um can you see my slides okay we can yeah okay great um hi everybody i'm christy warwick I'm a staff software engineer at Google, or I like to call myself an engineer, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with this. In Canada, there's very specific rules about who can call themselves an engineer. So if you're working in the US, you're a software engineer, but if you're working in Canada, you're a developer. So I'm a software developer. Um, I, here's just kind of a, an overview of what my career path has looked like. I, I'm, I'm from the Vancouver area, so I went to BCIT I did the two-year diploma program there called CST, and then I added on uh, another two years to get a full um, degree. And from there, I've worked in web development, had a few, mostly at actually local Vancouver companies in almost all of these cases, at companies like ARG, Gossamer Threads. Um, I worked at Western Union, Business Sol Western Union Business Solutions, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's a foreign currency exchange company. Um, that makes it sound like I tried to make a pie chart because this makes it look like the balance is all wrong. Actually, most of my career has been at uh, Demonware, which is another local Vancouver company. They have also they're actually well, they're actually Irish, but their main offices are in Ireland and in Vancouver. And I believe there's one there's one or two in China as well. Um, so that was where a lot of my career was. And then um, I decided to I left the local Vancouver scene and branched out and went to Google. And that's where I've at this point spent most of my career that has gone by uh, very quickly and been a lot of fun. So I've kind of had I've experienced a bunch of different things and I started in one place and then moved to something completely different. The some of the highlights of my career are um, I felt like I, I had to mention that I've actually made I've made so many friends along the way, especially I would say during my time at Demon where I've made friends with people that we still we work at so many different places now, but we still keep in contact and get together. I've, uh, I've also done a lot of speaking at conferences, which has been a lot of fun and also resulted in meeting a lot of people and a lot of travel opportunity, um, mostly pre-COVID. Since COVID, <laughs> very little travel involved, uh, but a lot before that. Um, also a highlight for me to, to work on games, like video games, and be like, I contributed to Call of Duty. It kind of feels cool. I mean, not that I necessarily like Call of Duty as a game particularly. That's a whole other topic. Um, I've also, uh, one of the, the biggest highlights of my career is that I started an open source project uh, called Tecton, which is what this cat logo is. Um, and I, I feel like it was like successful in like, like lots of people use it. And I got to work with people at other companies. And so I was actually collaborating with people who worked at totally different companies from mine. And I was also very lucky because the community of people that worked on it were all very um, kind and reasonable people. So it was a really positive experience and made some more lifelong friends that way. I've also uh, published a book, which I feel uh, very proud of because it was a lot of work. And I also ended up working on the last part of it while I was pregnant, which I don't, I don't recommend. I actually don't necessarily recommend writing a book either. I, I recommend having written a book, but not writing it because it is, it is grueling. It took about three years end to end to go from starting to actually um, getting it done. Uh, and then also being pregnant at the end wasn't, made, made it a lot harder, but also a career highlight. I um, had a baby and that was during my time working at Google and the maternity leave policy was pretty good. So I got a pretty sizable chunk of paid time off. And I felt like lots of people have negative experiences with that kind of thing. But personally, my experience was quite positive and I felt like I was able to kind of jump back in at the end with the support of my manager and everyone I was working with. 
So for me, a typical day, I try to think about what days are usually like. They do actually vary a lot, but usually I spend a bit of time um, answering email. I do code reviews is a big part of my time. Uh, code that's been written by other people on my team. I take a look and give feedback on it. I do have a lot of meetings. It depends, different, different phases of my career, I've had more meetings. And I also find if you get more senior in software development, you tend to spend a lot more time <laughs> in meetings, but they're very varied. Like some meetings, especially as a remote person who's working remotely, that's the only way I actually talk to anybody else is in a meeting. I don't get to just run into them at their desk. So some of the meetings are me talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody. Sometimes we're trying to whiteboard, even though we don't actually have a whiteboard and design something. Um, sometimes they're the kind of boring, more boring meeting where there's like 20 people and you're just sort of listening. Um, there's also a lot of like writing and researching that I do. And of course, a lot of coding, or I try. Again, that's another thing that changes as you become more senior as a software developer. Sometimes you end up in positions where you're more just kind of helping other people figure out what to code and not actually doing the hands-on work yourself. But I try, I try to do as much as I can. Um, but then some days also, honestly, are just meetings, meetings pretty much all day long. I, I really like software development. I think it's a good fit for me. Um, one of the reasons is because I feel like I have a lot of different interests. Like I like, I do like coding, but then I also like, uh, like public speaking. I like writing. I like interpersonal challenges. I also like to draw, but like not in a way where I would ever have considered a career where that's the primary thing I'm doing, but because there's enough varied work required in software development where I have to like make presentations sometimes, um, there's still an opportunity where I can kind of leverage that. And I do, I'm not, I'm not a paid artist, but I do get paid to make the art. So I feel like it's kind of a nice balance and I really enjoy that. So, and it's also not boring that way because there's lots of different things that I do. And I also think of um, programming as just like puzzle solving. So I feel like if you're the kind of person who enjoys solving puzzles, then you might really like programming because that's kind of what it is all day long. And one of my friends recently pointed out that it's also, they get a lot of like dopamine that way. Like, cause if you're like, if you're coding, you are kind of constantly getting that reinforcement where you're like, it's running, the test is passing. And that can actually be really satisfying. It really it makes for a really satisfying day. And then also I, I, I feel like I, I picked this job because I liked it, but then I feel really lucky because it turned out to be a job that's also in very high demand and it's compensated pretty well. So that's another reason why I like it for sure. Um, Tyler asked me before when we were talking, what was something I wish I knew about software development <laughs> before I got started. And what I would say is, um, I don't know, this movie is kind of old now and I haven't watched it recently. So I don't know how well it has stood up the test of time. I feel like everything that was made before like 2010 needs to be watched with like a, a little bit of a, you know, there's going to be some things in there that are odd, but um, the movie Office Space, I saw it when I was young uh, before um, software development. I didn't realize it was about software developers. I was just like, oh, <laughs> these people seem to have this incredibly boring <laughs> job where they're in this boring office and they're doing all of this TPS reports and stuff. And it was only later after I became a software developer that it finally, I rewatched it and I was like, wait a minute, those are software developers. And so I feel like that would have been good to know. I don't think that it's actually boring. I do think some, I know people who are in jobs that do fit that mold a lot more. So that's definitely... It's, it's an accurate representation of some parts of software development. Also, the creator of Office Space uh, made another series called Silicon Valley, which if you've seen it is also kind of a frighteningly accurate picture, I would say. It's like obviously exaggerated, but it is, it is a fairly accurate picture of what software development can be like. Um, well, the other thing I just wish I knew, which I noticed that um, this program emphasizes that is interviewing. Interviewing is super important. When I first um, like finished my diploma program at BCIT, and, launched into software development interviews, I was not ready <laughs> at all. I thought they were just gonna ask me about like a personal strength or something. And I wasn't prepared for the like coding and like architecture questions. So I think spending time um, getting good at interviewing is important. Cause that's kind of, it's almost its own skill separate from actually being able to do the job. Absolutely. Uh, so I work at Google now, um, reasons why I really like it, I feel very uh, supported and respected by everyone I work with, which is great. And these are all things that are my personal experience. I know there are other people who have worked at Google and have not had these experiences, uh, but fortunately I feel lucky enough to have had these experiences. I also feel like the work-life balance is really good. Um, again, probably some parts of the, it's a huge company, so there's probably some parts where this isn't true, but for myself and for everyone I've seen around me, I find that 
it's also I, well, it was coming from video games though, so it's a little bit of a change. But I was working with people that were a lot younger too, and at Google, there's a lot more like range just in terms of where people are at in their lives. So I think people are a lot more understanding of like you have kids you need to look after, you have elderly parents, you have all these other responsibilities, and the company is very good at making sure that everyone has room to do what they need to do. Um, there's also a lot of challenging problems to work on. I feel like I'm always learning. And it's also cool that people know what it is. When I tell my non-technical friends I work at Google, they're like, oh, Google, they think I work on the search part, which is not at all what I do. But they still do know what the place is where I work at. And that's kind of cool too. Yeah, doesn't everybody at Google just work on the search bar, the Google search bar page? <laughs> a, a surprising number of people, for sure. <laughs> uh, not, not, not one of them, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, lastly, just a couple thoughts if you're interested at in working at Google. I think it's very doable. Um, what actually motivated me to apply at Google was that a coworker of mine applied and started going through the interview process and didn't make it. But somehow the fact that he did that and like survived made me feel like, oh, I might as well give it a shot. Like he, he lived through the experience. I could try it. Um, and like my experience is it, it is doable. There's the, the format of the interviews is pretty... Um, they make a, a big effort to try to make it as impartial as possible, which it never can be perfectly that, but it is pretty like if you study the right things and you practice the right things, then I think you can do it. Um, it just takes, it does take a lot of study though. And I also particularly recommend practicing talking through your answers. So don't just practice solving algorithmic questions, but also practice being able to talk out the, the solution with someone. Cause that's kind of what the whole thing is. It's just working with somebody to solve a problem and showing your thought process and communicating with them about it. You don't even necessarily have to be able to get the right answer. It's not like a trick question. It's just about being able to work through the problem. Um, also just a note about uh, Canada and Google, the, there are remote, I'm lucky enough to have a remote position. They're more rare. They do have offices in um, Waterloo, Toronto and Montreal. So if you did want to pursue a job at Google, you'd probably be more likely to be looking for a place where you'd relocate um, to get there, which, I mean, it's kind of fun too. Like I actually relocated with Google to San Francisco and then to New York. So for me, it was a, when I was younger, it was a fun opportunity to try living in some different places. Those were like two of my favorite Americans. I'm sure they are for a lot of people, but I've yes. gone to conferences in both of those places many times and they're, they're both my favorite cities for sure. Yeah, I miss, I particularly miss New York. That was an awesome place to live, but we lived there during, that was during the pandemic. So it was also a very strange time to be in New York. If it hadn't been for that particular period of time, I do wonder if we'd have stayed there because it's just such a cool place to work. But being like locked, locked there and not being able to travel back and see family made it so we kind of just decided Hopefully. to come back. Um, all right, and that is everything that I have for slides. Oh, perfect. So I've uh, I put some questions together. Um, and so you probably answered some of that in the questions that uh, that I've got for you here. So we'll just do our best if I if I ask you something that we've already talked about, then we'll just kind of go go past that part there. But um, so I was going to ask you initially to introduce yourself and share your current role and responsibilities, which is perfect. You just did that in, in slide format. <laughs> Um, and you you kind of shared a little bit uh, about what inspired you to pursue you, pursue a career in software development as well. Um, I guess even more so uh, pursue specific um, opportunities at things like Google and stuff. But um, maybe just uh, reiterate on that. What was the initial thing that kind of sparked you to be interested in uh, software development as a just as a, a career in general? I think for me it was mostly just wondering. Like one day I just realized I don't have any. I didn't have any idea how computers worked. <laughs> And I was, this was in high school and there was a friend of mine and he knew programming. And so I started asking him, I was like, what is this? How does this even work? What is even going on here? So it was kind of like an, an intense curiosity to just sort of understand what was going on. I still, it's still like there's significant limitations to what I could explain about what's going on, but I at least feel like I understand some pieces of it. Um, so it's like largely curiosity, I think that moved me into programming in general. And then again, just like finding that there are so many ways I could leverage different skills has mm -hmm. been what's really kind of kept me kept me in it. Well, I like what you said too, about feeling like it's almost like instant gratification, like, you know, with, when you have code that works, and it's like yeah. a math problem that comes together. It's uh, even on my side, when I do anything like website designing in my role, and, and things communicate and work properly, and the, you know, the forms are working with the pages, and yeah. everything's working, it's just, it's a, it's a really good feeling. So yeah, definitely. it's like, it's like cutting the grass, it's like instant gratification. 
But um, yeah, so just I just want to highlight that because you mentioned that before too. But um, and then can you share um, some highlights or projects that you've worked on uh, during your time as a software developer? I know you were you worked in gaming too, so there's probably some fun stuff on uh, on, on different sides there. Um, yeah, at, in in the on the gaming side, uh, I worked on what I worked on was back end services for video games. So it was kind of the like the online pieces, like the um, the matchmaking, like finding other players to play with. Um, keeping track of like people's scores. Um, the, I guess one of the, the most satisfying times were, and also the hardest were the Call of Duty. I'm actually not sure, it's probably still the same, but I definitely followed out of the, the loop on it, but it would release every year around the same time. So there would be this, this like pressure that would just increase up until launch and then launch would happen. And it used to be that the discs were actually printed at that point. I hope that's, hopefully that's not so much a concern anymore, but it was like, they have to be pressed at that point. So everything has to work. And then that would also mean that we get like this huge, like like the usage of the game would look like nothing and then massive, like a massive amount in the beginning. So we did a lot of work to like make sure that we could handle that. But like basically those launches were all just super exciting. It was stressful, but it was also almost this like kind of party atmosphere where everybody's like wants to see what happened, what's going to happen and it's like <laughs> something horrible could go wrong at any time. But you also get to see like millions of people using the game and like using the stuff that you made. It was very satisfying. And I think it was like, I think it was Black Ops 2, I want to say, hmm, might not be quite right, but I think that was the one where we had the highest usage ever. And I worked on that one and was worked on that launch. And that was, that was pretty cool. It's too bad I don't like Call of Duty more, though. That would have made it more satisfying, but. <laughs> yeah, well, as, as somebody like I'm, a, I consider myself a senior Fortnite player. I always laugh. I'm 37 <laughs> years old and I'm playing Fortnite. Like, thank, thank God I can't see the people on the other side. They're probably like, you know, <laughs> 10 year olds that I'm getting mad at that killed me. Yeah, my, my um, husband plays a lot of Valorant and it's like a similar thing. I think he just mutes everybody at this point. <laughs> oh, I, I do too. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't really listen. I try not to, but yeah, somebody who plays a large game like that, that uh, has a lot of updates and, you know, bug fixes and things that happen with all of the live updates. Uh, I totally get the, there's probably a lot of pressure on the back end uh, for that team working on that. So um, and I should shout out as well, just everybody in the crowd. So um, we're talking about the software development course here today. Um, but just in case anybody is really interested in software development with a special interest in uh, game development, we do also have a course specifically catered to that available through UBC as well. So uh, we are going to focus on the software development today, but you know it overlaps with the gaming industry. The coding side overlaps quite a bit. So gaming might come into the conversation a few times, but just in case anybody is really interested in that side, just know that we, we do actually have boot camps for both of those through UBC. So... Uh, so hold on, let me see what else I had here for you. Um, oh yeah, so how do you uh, like to stay updated with the latest trends and advancements in uh, in the industry? Uh, that's a that's a, a funny question because I feel like I'm not very good at that. I would say like I think that my my strategy is mostly to um, just kind of like <laughs> absorb the information as I'm working on something. So if I'm not like working in a specific area, then I will learn pretty much nothing about it because I am not good at keeping in the loop, which is like a probably a weakness. But I also, I mean, in my defense, I really like to have like separation for me. Like when I'm not working, I like to not work. Early in my career, I felt like, oh, I have to have all these projects on the side. I have to be like looking at tech stuff all the time. But now for me, it's very much like I do all my tech stuff while I'm working and then I do like totally different things in my off hours. Um, but so what I do to learn, I guess, is to like work on the thing. Like right now I'm working on um, a lot of features that are using AI. So I am actually learning about that, but it's because I'm working on it. If I wasn't working on it, I wouldn't be learning anything. Um, so pretty much like hands-on, I guess, like trying to even, like recently I worked on a small open source tool where I got to like pull together, um, it's basically using, uh, if, you're, if you've heard of like Hugging Face, it's like a model, reposit uh, uh, model repository where you can pull models that people um, host and I was using that to like run local models and like I didn't even know what these phrases meant when I when I entered into it but the, through the process of having to plug these things together I was just like all right I'll just learn about these things one at a time and try it out so that's I, I guess I keep up with things by trying them out and getting hands on with them is my approach. Well, and you're in a little bit more, you've kind of touched on this a few times, but you're in a little bit more of a senior role now. I, I feel like it's, you know, when people are, are first getting into any industry, the best thing to do is try and immerse yourself in as much as you can, you know, uh, network with as many different people as you can. And, but, uh, you know, that's a natural progression, I think, though, like as you get further into a role, uh, you're doing less coding and more emailing and you're <laughs> you're not necessarily, you know, immersing yourself into the industry trends as much as you probably did at the start there. 
And I also resonate with what you said too, because I, I like to be immersed in, in my work, but then also I like to completely separate sometimes. Mm -hmm. I also do, I do digital drawing myself. I don't know if that's what you do too, but um, yeah, it's just, it's fun to kind of um, let your brain go over into that space for a little mm -hmm. while too, and, and just kind of uh, separate. So, um, all right. So um, I've got this question. It was number five in the list I sent you, but I'm, I'm actually going to ask it later, I think, because okay. it's the question I wanted later on. So, um, so how do you uh, prioritize tasks and manage your time effectively in um, the fast paced, you know, environment? And even more so, I guess I could lead into like, how did you do that in the earlier stages of your career? It's a good question. I guess I find it's gotten harder in later the later part of my career like i feel like when i was just starting out it was pretty clear what i needed to do all day long which was coding pretty much and then there'd be like every once in a while somebody would have a meeting and i'd be really excited i'd be like oh i've been invited to a meeting what's happening in this meeting and like if i wasn't invited to a meeting i'd be like oh why didn't they include me like i'm important too uh, which which is true you know but i but now it's really reversed where now the less meetings i get invited to the better and i'm like struggling to find time for coding so i guess I think early, maybe I just don't even, early on, I feel like the prioritization just was not as much of a, of a big deal for me because people would also, people would tell me what to do for like to a large extent. Like, I mean, when you're more junior in a role, like you can, you, you really can lean on other more senior people to be like, this is your new, these tasks, do these tasks. Um, but then as I become more senior, it's, it's way more up to me. So I go back and forth with all kinds of different time management approaches. And I find that I have to, I have to like revisit it and shift it or it, or it doesn't, it'll stop working for me. So right now what I do is I do a process of, um, I have like a big to-do list. I revisit it every week and I try to look at like for this week, what are the few things I want to do? And then every day I try to be like, what is my top thing that I'm going to do? I wish it was one. I always end up with like three, but like ideally I would just pick one and be like, what's the thing that if I did this today, I would feel really good at the end of the day. And then I tried to sort of fit that in between all my meetings and other things. For a long time, I was blocking off chunks of my calendar for focus time. Um, but then my calendar got really depressing because it was just all full. It was like these thick blocks. So now I'm trying to keep it open. I don't know. I think the biggest thing for me is like revisiting it regularly and like re-examining it on like a daily, weekly. And I'm trying to do like monthly, like sit back and reflect on my goals, that kind of thing. Um, but it's hard. I think that is one of the most challenging parts. And as you get more senior, and I think that can make a lot of difference for people too and how they can advance because if you spend your time on the on things that aren't feel important to you, but they're not actually making a difference to the people who are making decisions about your compensation and promotion and all of that, then it'll be harder to progress. So it's tough. It's, it's, it's really a balance. I hear that. Yeah. I mean, in my role too, it's always, I, I'm a huge list person, right? It's uh, I go back to that instant gratification. When you check something yeah. off of a list, it just, it feels great. So it's like the little dopamine hits throughout the day when you feel like you're getting things done. So definitely. I'm the same way. I'm definitely the same way. But also what you said is kind of what my calendar looks like this week. It's a, it's a, depress <laughs> a depressive big block of things. <laughs> off this week. Oh, I'm sorry. So I go between those two, but um, all right. What else did I have here? Um, what do you enjoy most about being a software? For developer and what uh, keeps you motivated in your current role? Um, let's see, I guess I'm trying to think of something more than we kind of already talked about, like those, those constant dopamine hits are a big thing. I think that, I think a big thing for me too, is anytime that I can actually have an impact on somebody else that makes a huge, those are the moments that I remember where even like somebody sends me, like, I remember someone sending me a nice message like eight years ago and being like, Hey, when you said this thing, it really made me feel like more confident about that. Like, like those moments aren't, it's, they're not getting those every day, but like getting those every once in a while really make a big difference. So I think it's anything where I feel like I can have a positive impact on someone else. And I hope that they like just, you know, they're, I hope that I, I help them have a slightly better day because they're working with me sort of thing like that, that really kind of keeps me going. So yeah, if you ever think of sending a nice message to someone and you're thinking about it, I say, just do it. Cause you never know when that message might like actually make a big difference for them or like really like they'll remember it for a long time afterward. Uh, but I don't know if that actually answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. Okay. It does. But, uh, yeah, it's just different ways to keep yourself motivated. Uh, in our company, we have something called uh, kudos where yeah. uh, when somebody does something really cool, we, we in, uh, shout them out in our internalized Slack channel and give them kudos. And then it tallies, you know, how many kudos each person has and oh. it's really cool way to kind of uh, highlight people for doing things, especially if they go out of their way to do something nice or they say something nice about you or, you know, whatever the case may be. So um, same concept, but 
Um, and then what strategies do you use for troubleshooting in debugging code when faced with unexpected issues? I feel like this is a big question. I, I don't know if that, but I'll let you kind of tackle that one the best you can. Sure, it's a good, it's a good question. I think it's, um, I have like one particular recommendation, I guess, which is sort of like a fall fallback if things don't, like usually what I do is I just flail around for a while and I just look at like, I just look at like, you know, like what are the logs? Can I make any guesses? Like try to make like intuitive guesses about what's going on based on what I know. And then often that stops working. And um, the thing that the thing that really helps me in a case where I don't know what's going on is to try to be really, really methodical and keep like a log. And I think this is something that people don't do enough. And I even find myself like it's like you like you need to know like if I try something, um, make sure you don't do the same thing again like an hour later because you forgot you already tried it. So when things really fall apart, I will actually keep a list of like I tried this, this is what happened. I tried this, this is what happened, and really get methodical about it. And that's how. Like some of the bugs that I'm the most proud of figuring out, like that was the approach that it took to get to it. And it was really just being like methodical and determined that got, that got me to the end of it. It wasn't necessarily like having any specific knowledge about the thing. It's just like, what else can I try? What have I not tried here? And, and, then, even, and then even reaching out to other people, like here's all the things I've tried. Can you think of anything else I haven't tried? Just that like methodical approach. Debugging is actually one of the things I love most about software as well in terms of that, that gratification because you're like solving a mystery. It's like doing forensics, but hopefully nobody's actually like died or, or been injured or anything. You're just like trying to get to the bottom of a mystery. And almost all of them are findable. Like that's what's really cool about it too. Like there are there is the odd thing where like maybe it'll never happen again and you'll never be able to reproduce it. But like the answer is out there and you can get there. Not and you don't have to be like a genius, just like slowly and methodically, like keep going and don't give up. It's like, yeah, that's, I always compare it um, when I hear people in our company talking about coding too. It just reminds me of math. Um, so I used to work in roles um, in hospitality and tourism when I had to do a lot of billing and a lot of invoicing um, for different types of events and just, you know, just whatever I was working on in my career. But there's times where the numbers would just not balance and it was, you know, it took me forever. And it's, you, you look at it all as a whole thing. And then until you finally sit down and just go through a little step-by-step -step and look at each equation. And then you're like, oh, I can't believe I looked at this 17 times. And it's, you know, it was sitting right in front of me the whole time. So that's, uh, it was the same thing. It was frustrating at times, but then once you get it, it's such a such a, an accomplishment and such a good dopamine hit too. So, um, and just a quick shout out to Robert there. Um, I saw that you uh, mentioned that. Yeah, we'll do the, um, the Q&A session at the end here uh, so for anybody who has questions just keep putting them in the questions tab and then we'll kind of post them up for the, cl the class is the way I say it on the on the screen and um, between the two of us here we'll do our best to kind of answer all of those questions at the end there so um, so what else did I have for you what strategies do you use for troubleshooting nope we just did that one um, could you share any lessons or uh, lessons learned or mistakes you've made in your career that have helped you grow as a developer that's a good question Oh, that's a good question. I'm trying to think of whether I'm trying to think of which uh, whether to go to the like <laughs> the more like juicy and dramatic ones or not. I guess for me, one of the one of the biggest one of the biggest like mistakes I made, or I don't know. Basically, I um, I my journey going from the previous company I worked at to Google, uh, I kind of I I had some disagreements with people I worked with that like I kind of left in like a blaze of glory. It was like my perspective on it. And I've reflected on that several times over the, like, as the years have passed. And I feel like very differently about it. Like at first I was just very mad and I was like, I was in the right, they should have listened to me. And then later a few years passed and I reflected on it. And I was like, I, I had, I have this tendency to get very, um, like, uh, like I, I, I deal with my con. Like I, I had this idea that there was one right way to do it. And I just was not really open to other, I was like, no, but this is right. You haven't convinced me the other ways are right. So I reflected on it. I was like, you know, I could have actually been way more skillful at this and way more like, I could have actually integrated other people's ideas and I could have changed it. And they probably would have convinced them eventually. It just would have taken longer, like a couple of years. Uh, and then a few more years passed and now I'm <laughs> I looked at it again and I was like, you know what, I'm actually glad that happened because I left and I went to Google and I'm really happy at Google. So, so I don't know, I guess, I guess my, maybe my takeaway from that is I, I think that sometimes when things are not working, when you're working with other people, it, sometimes you just need to get out of there. And I've seen that with other people that I've worked with too, where there's some situation and it just seems to be impossible to get to get unstuck from it. And I think in software, we're also really lucky because software developers are quite employable. So there are other options. It's definitely not the case in every industry or position. Like sometimes you're stuck with something that where you're not being treated very well or things aren't working out. But as a software developer, you can actually, there are, 
the economy is really weird right now. It's definitely harder, but there are there are jobs out there and you can move to something else. So I think what I learned was that I was glad that I really <laughs> glad that I moved on to the other thing. Um, but I could have been more skillful, definitely. I would not handle that same situation the same way again today, for sure. I don't know. I loved the blaze of glory. <laughs> <laughs> but you only want to set so many of those fires because like I think definitely generally don't burn your bridges because the other thing is that like networks and like connections in this industry are so important and like Absolutely. most of the positions I've gotten have been because I knew somebody and had that connection and they like they recommended it and they passed my resume along and so I definitely recommend burning as few bridges as possible but yeah it was very traumatic. <laughs> And that, well, and this gives me a good segue too to kind of mention that we do have uh, as a part of our boot camps, uh, just, you know, uh, once you're a student of CircuitStream uh, in any capacity, you're, you're brought into our network and we've got uh, an incredible network of people. So like if you're, you know, you've taken the course with us and you're you're just working on something even in your career afterwards and you're like, geez, I need to figure out how to debug this or figure out this part of it, um, you know, kind of to your point and, and not burning bridges and keeping strong connections with people. Um, you just have this really cool network of people that you can lean on at any time through, uh, I said Slack, but it's actually Discord. Our internal is Slack. Our uh, student facing is, is Discord server. So um, cool network opportunities for students that come through and just uh, tons of opportunities to assist you in uh, early stages of your career that way too. So sorry, Christy, I just saw a quick little segue opportunity from what you were saying there. So actually, um, actually speaking of segues though, I'll add one more one more answer to your question okay. if that's okay. Yeah. More of, a tech, more of a technical answer. Um, I, I, there have there have been times when I have um, I have like run a command and then um, destroyed something in production, <laughs> uh, and I I just wanted to mention like the main thing that I've learned from those things, and this is why I really like uh, this is like a whole other topic, but this is why I really like the the whole continuous delivery space I, is because one of the sort of um, one of the kind of principles behind it is that when those sorts of things happen instead of blaming a person who does something, it's better to like step back and look at the process that led to that. And as a company, um, we, I'm sure everybody knows Etsy. They, they used to have a thing. I don't know if they still have it, but they had this three arm sweater award or something like that, where they would give an award basically to the person who made the biggest mistake in the year, like the person who caused the biggest problem. And their, sort, and their mentality was that if by doing that, it's revealed kind of like underlying problems in their processes that need to get fixed. So it's not like the individual person isn't really to blame. It's more like the processes weren't there to support them being able to like develop in a way that's <laughs> safe where you're not going to suddenly accidentally take out production. And I really like that. So I also really recommend when you're uh, looking for a place to work or choosing an employer, like looking at what their processes are and if they have kind of a blameless culture where they improve things or if they, you know, they blame a person and make you feel bad because you made a mistake. And and also like just not to be afraid of mistakes too because they're just great learning opportunities generally. yeah that, that's what i was gonna say that's what that like really instills to me is just like you know if you get you, you get an award for making it's not going to encourage you to make the biggest mistake but it it encourages you to not be scared to make it you know like to just kind of to to leap and and, and do some of those things sometimes and not feel like the entire pressure is going to fall back on you so um actually feels very similar uh culture of the company i'm at right now which is great so that's great uh, yeah um and then so uh what are some common misconceptions about software development that you have encountered and uh, i have and how would you like to address them i don't i don't need to put that part but <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know if i'm in a position to address address them um, misconceptions i guess um well there's a lot of i think that people might think that I'm sure that everybody can think, but there might be like a like an idea of like the ideal software developer being like somebody who's like a extremely like I want to say like genius or like that they have they have like an uh, an above average intelligence, especially in some particular area where they like know absolutely everything. Um, and I guess I would say that the people that are the most effective that I've worked with have been like you definitely need a certain like base amount of knowledge, but I think that they're more just um, just like again like they just you just sort of are methodical in the way you do things like take it one step at a time take your take your baby steps forward um and uh and and also like communicate well with other people like i think i think those things like being able to organize your time being able to be methodical in your approaches and being able to communicate like those make a huge difference like when i think of people i work with who i want to like give more responsibility to one of the main things that they do is they just tell me like where they're at with things they tell me when things are getting completed, they tell me when they're stuck, they say they're going to do something and they actually do it. Like those are the kinds of traits that I think actually make you succeed. You, you do need that baseline of knowledge, but you don't need to be like an expert. You don't even necessarily need to go super deep on something. Um, but yeah, and there's, and there's just so many different areas to work in in software development too. So 
there definitely are places for people who do have expertise in particular areas, but there's so much more to be done where you don't need that. Um, yeah. Totally. Yeah, no, absolutely. I saw some thumbs up there while you're chatting to come through. So, um, and then this is a question I had earlier that I was going to ask you, but, uh, what advice would you give to new software developers just starting out in uh, the industry? Let's see. Good question. Um, <laughs> I, I guess a few things that come to mind. I think one thing. Okay, I'll just, I'll just say a few a few sort of thoughts that are that are coming to mind. One is that I, I at least I found personally my experience with my first interviews was like I, I guess I kind of mentioned this. I was Ill, I wasn't prepared for them, and so I, I I kept getting rejected, and I felt really bad about it. And I was like, I really want somebody to accept me. But I guess one thing I would say is to realize that the interviews really do go both ways. Like. Once you get past that hurdle and you do get hired, you might you might hate the company that you're at. So I, I feel like just remembering that like you want to be happy as well. I think it's really hard with the first job though, because you really need you really do need to get past and get some experience. I guess if you do end up somewhere you hate, like go somewhere else. Like use that as your like launching off point. Like you are employed, you're, you're starting to have a track record. Go find you're in a good place actually to find something that you do really like. Um, so I think like value yourself. And, and also like in terms of valuing yourself, like value your work-life balance as well. It, it becomes easier as you become more senior and you have kind of like more leverage, um, but definitely like don't put up with being treated badly, especially because again, like the software engineers do have the flexibility to find other positions. So like, it's not, if they're not treating you well, uh, go somewhere else. Um, the other thing I would say is to, this is like kind of standard, well, I think there's a balance to be had in terms of um, when you're starting out somewhere and you're trying to figure things out, trying to finding the right balance between how much you lean on other people and ask for help and how much you try yourself. And I think it, it works for me to come up with kind of like a rule of thumb where like these are sort of made up numbers and you can pick your own, but like if you're stuck, try for another like three hours or hour before you ask for help. Like don't just ask for help immediately, like repeatedly whenever you're a little bit stuck, like try a little bit more, dig a little bit more. Um, and, but then if you are truly stuck, which is like, you can't think of anything else or it's been like a few days and you haven't made any progress, like do ask for help. Like, I think it's the, like, don't let yourself be stuck for too long, but also don't just kind of knee jerk into getting other people to solve your problems for you. Cause you might really learn a lot through the process of having to kind of force yourself to be like, what else can I try? Where else can I look? How else can I approach this? And I think that doing that like really helps you to just like, if you can maintain that, it really helps you to be able to sort of dive in to any kind of new domain and then also just keep growing over time. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I, again, I can see the, the thumbs up coming in on the side there, but I feel like that resonates like in any, any position I've ever had to, you know, you can very easily get into the habit of just asking, 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 asking. And um, a rule of thumb that I've given myself, it's, uh, it's not even so much a time parameter. I, I just gave myself like a try three different approaches and try and mm -hmm. figure it out. And if you know, if you can't get it after you've done that, or you end up, you know, hitting your head against the wall for an hour or two, maybe it does turn into a time parameter eventually. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, eventually, then then it's it's always good to ask. But uh, I, I completely agree. It's, you know, you kind of change your 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 brain process, especially when you're, you're moving into something as a new career opportunity for you. It's really cool to kind of learn the foundational aspects of it and, and kind of, you know, challenge yourself to think a little bit outside the box versus just asking everybody else to give you the answers all the time. So, which is another great reason why a boot camp is a really good way for people to learn because <laughs> it offers, you know, hands-on support, which I'll, I'll share a little bit more about um, the boot camp information here in a minute too. But um, I think that was it. Um, something I'll ask you too, Christy, if, if you want, um, I didn't uh, ask you this in advance, but if you have any way for the crowd to get a hold of you, uh, to add you on LinkedIn, um, to any, anywhere that you're comfortable with them kind of finding you, feel free to share those uh, links in the chat off to the right hand side there. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take over for just a minute here and share some information about the upcoming uh, cohort start dates. Um, I'll share information uh, about the course pricing, just, um, you know, all that, the time slots, all that kind of fun stuff. And then uh, that'll take about five minutes. And after I do that, I'm going to invite Christy to come back up and we're going to take a quick look through the, uh, the questions tab and try and answer the, uh, the questions that you guys have sent through the best we can. So, so thank you so much, uh, Christy. I'm, uh, I'm going to kick you off and I'll, I'll see you back here in about five. <laughs> Okay, so let me just get my presentation back over here again, resize all of my screens. 
There we go. So yeah, as I mentioned here, I'm just gonna share some information about the upcoming uh, cohort uh, start dates, the pricing, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, let me get this here. So I'll start with the pricing information. Um, the full cost of this bootcamp is $14,995. Uh, students are obviously able to pay for the bootcamp up, up front, uh, but we do also have payment plans available over six, 12 and 24 month periods. And for anybody who's registered for this event, we actually have a special promotion in place with 10% off of the bootcamp price. Um, so this would be available um, up until March 8th or until the course seats are filled. And I do think at this time, the upcoming cohort, I'm going to share the start date in a moment, but I think the uh, cohort that we have coming up in a month or so here is, is starting to get quite limited. So um, if you do have uh, any questions, if you're looking um, to apply um, or just you know find more information, I'll share some links in a moment, but uh, just reach out and let us know. Uh, and of course, we can um, honor the registrant promotion for anybody who um, registered for this event here. And as I mentioned, all the cohorts typically run uh, several times a year, but the upcoming cohort will be from April 9th to December 12th. And then following that, we will have one uh, started, starting in September uh, 2024 and running through to May 2025. I don't think we have the specific dates of that one confirmed yet. Um, they, may, they may on the education team on that side, but um, that's roughly the, the timeline. So, uh, And I believe that promotion that we have uh, right now would be applicable for the next two start dates. So. Um, if for any reason the April date was full and you were looking to apply, or if it just worked better for you to apply for the September date, just let us know and we can make sure we um, get the promotion in there for you as well for that. And then, yeah, uh, this is what I mentioned. I was going to share some contact details for everyone. So if you have any questions about the courses or how to get started um, or just anything at all, you can reach out to us directly, uh, the 1-800 number there um, or the email. Um, I also put a QR code here up on the screen. So I shared the link in the chat earlier in this presentation, but uh, you can scan this QR code here and it'll take you right to our software development bootcamp page. Um, on that page, you can find information about it. Um, you can also request the syllabus with even more detailed info uh, and that'll just get emailed to your, your uh, email inbox there. So uh, just, just ways to kind of access the, the information. I just wanna make sure I provided everybody with that. And that's it. I told you it was just going to be really quickly. Just uh, go over the the information. Just want to make sure everybody uh, knew how to access the the course details there. And now I'm going to close this part of the presentation, and I'm going to invite Christy back up on stage. <laughs> I literally kicked you off for like a minute and a half. Sorry, Christy. <laughs> there we go. Um, perfect. So uh, let me open the questions tab there. Uh, okay, and I'll go down to the bottom. Um, in BC, there are many computing, uh, computing grads with uh, computer science degrees or diplomas. How can a boot camp um, be competitive versus these grads? That's a great question. We've got 15 upvotes on that one. Apparently, a lot of people are interested in that. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, Christy and I actually didn't talk about this specific topic before this presentation. Um, but um, based on my conversations that I've had um, in the industry and just with other uh, professionals in the industry, the opportunities don't go just for people who have degrees. They don't go for just for people who have diplomas. Um, experience speaks volumes. Um, career support speaks volumes, how you present yourself. I mean, Christy uh, was explaining that she went through the diploma um, uh, course initially and then was going to apply and wish she had had some advice on how to present and how to answer questions. And, you know, so a two-year diploma course is uh, is a great way to kind of look at something comparatively that's education versus a, um, a, boot, a boot camp that would run for several months that might not cover all of the aspects of a two-year course, but it's supposed to provide you more with the foundational support that you need. And then also with career support with, you know, more as much hands-on support as you can get, I guess, like boot, boot camps are usually pretty good at doing that. So, uh, but maybe if you wanted to weigh in on any of that as well, Christy. I think the only thing that I would add is just plus one to the experience being more important. I think also, um, I'm not sure what it will, I think that it's always a, a challenge to find your first position, but once you've got that first position, then I would say that the education that you had beforehand doesn't really matter as much, unless there's something specific you're trying to do. Like I saw there's a question about the like NAFTA and TN visas, and I don't know if this is still the case, but at least when I got that visa, like you had to have a certain kind of degree in order to get the visa. So if there's something specific like that, then there are there are particular requirements, but other than that, and that's only like the people hiring you don't care about that. That's only so because there's like the legal requirements for getting the visa. As far as the people that are hiring you are concerned, they're more interested in what you can actually do. Uh, so I think like Tyler was saying, like experience is really the thing that matters. 
Yeah, if you can solve the problems and you can prove that you can solve the problems for what they need, um, some larger companies might have some more barriers. It's similar to our game game development boot camp. You know, you've got uh, people who have gone through for computer science, and then people who have gone through on that uh, through the boot, the boot camp side. And what I hear from people, especially in hiring roles, is exactly what you just said. Like experience speaks volumes. Um, oftentimes, they will look at uh, educational experience, you know, uh, in terms of, of what somebody has. But I've heard so many times that people have come into interviews and there's two people with degrees and one person who doesn't. And the one person who doesn't may have just presented themselves better in the interview and, you know, provided better examples of how they can solve the problems that the company needs and they get the opportunity. So it's, you know, it's, it's not always going to be one way or the other. I think any education in general is always going to help you. Uh, trying to do anything on your own would be quite difficult. But um, having the support of a diploma, a degree, or a boot camp, um, they, they may not be equal for all companies in terms of your opportunities there. Like like we said, some larger companies might might require a few more hurdles to get through, but uh, there's certainly opportunities. And you know, I, I think the biggest takeaway is uh, how much opportunity there is for software developers. Like the the numbers I shared early in the presentation were just for BC. So like the if you if you could take that and kind of look at the opportunities even Canada wide um, or you know worldwide I guess if you want to go go that far but you can imagine there's there's quite a bit of opportunity for uh, developers software developers for sure so so hopefully that answers your question there um, if you do have more questions about that feel free to reach out to our team there um, they can provide more details for you they can provide um, some success stories on, from some of our students as well so. And then I think you already kind of touched on this one Christy but I'm just going to put this back up here again. Um, he's a, uh, so uh, maybe, maybe just elaborate on that part again, Christy, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I did know about the TN visa before, um, applying at Google because I knew other people who had done similar things. Um, and I guess I would say generally, whenever I have talked with a potential employer, um, when I was in a situation where like they were in a different country, I would, I definitely made that requirement clear up front because some companies just can't really support the process or they don't have the like the lawyers to to support you going through the process of getting those visas um so i would probably be up very upfront with a potential employer about like what your needs are because it's probably not worth going through the rest of the process if they can't support that um but like but then with larger companies like google like they have a massive legal team that just kind of handles everything for you so it's a it's a it's definitely an advantage but yeah i would be very upfront about that before getting to a stage where you get a job offer 100 percent. yeah i agree with that um, now, this one's good, too. Um, how volatile is the job market? Are layoffs uh, something to be concerned about? Or is that more just media hype? Um, I can talk like in terms of development on the game side, too. I know um, that's that was a focus for a lot of people. Um, but I, we've, I've gone to some conferences and I've talked to quite a few people in the industry. And um, the general consensus that I've heard is that there was there's quite a bit of overhiring that happened during COVID. And so we're seeing a lot of that kind of balance out now. Um, so, you know, there, there's probably more to it in, in certain uh, circumstances, but just in general, seeing like a lot of layoffs in like game development and, and things like that, you know, you have to kind of watch things balance a little bit after you go through something like COVID and you get massive amounts of people hired from work at home positions, and then people end up going back into office environments and that changes how things work as well. So, I mean, that that's just some of the feedback I'm getting. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's probably a million different factors to it, but um, from what I'm getting, it's not it's not something to be discouraged about. There's still, I mean, look, look at the opportunity side, I guess, that I shared earlier in the presentation. There's still a ton of opportunities there. But uh, go, and go ahead, Christy, I can see you kind of nodding along there as well. Um, I guess this is completely just my own opinion. Um, I, 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 I mean, I think that you're right. Like it is, it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's not great that all of these layoffs are happening. And like, I know so many people who've been impacted by them. I mean, they've been laid off. Like I know like friends who have been laid off from their jobs. Like the, I think it is tougher right now, certainly than it was uh, a, a few years ago. Um, I do still feel very confident though, that like, this is just a very employable job to be doing. Like they just, we just still, we still need, everyone needs software developers. They may have decided they needed slightly less than they thought they needed, but there still are so many jobs out there. So I think it is a real concern. It's not just media hype, like it's happening. Like so many companies are like, like Google did layoffs. My husband works for a startup, they did layoffs. I have a friend who was laid off from her job. Like it, it is it is real. Um, but like like Tyler was saying, like it 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 like it, it comes it, it ebbs and flows all the time, like goes through these different phases. So hopefully it'll get better soon. Um, but still I think it's still a a, a very there's still a lot of positions out there and lots of people still need and like Google did a bunch of layoffs but is still hiring maybe not as much as before but that the hiring is still happening 
I think, yeah, I think it just kind of speaks to like the world we're in in 2024. I think that's just kind of the way that industries run now. We, you know, you kind of go with the ebbs and flows of what's working and what's not working. Um, and it just seems so fast paced in my, in my opinion, from what it was probably 20, 30, 40 years ago, I think about, you know, my parents going through uh, their careers and it was, they certainly didn't have as many ebbs and flows and, and switches and highs and lows, uh, as we t seem to see now in, in most industries. So, um, so yeah, so hopefully, uh, uh Garrett that, uh, or Robert, sorry, that answers your question. Oh no, this was a uh, Garrett's, um, Garrett, your question there. Um, Let's see, there's a lot of worry in gen AI tech displacing software developers, especially at the entry level. Is that just hype? Uh, I have a little bit of an answer to that, but I don't know if you, I mean, from anybody I've I've spoken to in, in uh, the tech industry, they, <clears throat> they're working with AI. They're not being replaced by AI. Um, I think in terms of AI actually displacing and taking over jobs, we're, we're probably quite a ways away from most of that happening. Um, yeah, because most people I see are just using AI tools. I mean, I use ChatGBT 20,000 times a week for things now, but I use it in support to help me in writing things. I don't let it do my job for me. So it's, you know, I think that's that's kind of what I'm seeing, but I'll let you answer that one as well, Christy. Yeah, it's a um, it's interesting. I don't, I I guess I my short answer would be that I do think it's kind of hype. Like, like Tyler was saying, like, I think my, my whole view about, about AI and you know, as a software developer is to just like embrace it as much as you can and use it. Cause I think it actually can make your job a lot easier. And I think Tyler, I noticed that in the boot camp, there's even the, there's something about GitHub Copilot mentioned mm -hmm. there. Like there's just there, like, I, I don't think there are any, I haven't seen any indications of technology that would actually in this space yet, and who knows what will happen, but that would actually replace a person. I have seen a lot of things that will help you be able to do your job faster. And so potentially you could be asked to do more as one developer because the expectations could get higher. But as far as actually replacing people, definitely not. Because a lot of what's produced is actually, um, it helps, but you need to be able to, you need like, if there's some code generated, you need to be able to understand if it's actually good and if it's actually doing what you want. And there's, um, there's a company called Seek, uh, S-N-Y-K, that publishes, they're a security company. They published a report recently that was about um, all these vulnerabilities that are being introduced into software because of people relying on um, code that's been generated and they're just taking the generated code and using it. It's actually like making it so that if there's a vulnerability somewhere, people are just copying and pasting it into a whole bunch of different locations. So I think there's like new problems almost emerging and, and, and nothing that would indicate to me that developers would be completely replaced, just that there'll be like new challenges. Um, so my recommendation would be to like try to, to use these technologies though and try to leverage them. And it almost makes you like a, like a, what's it called? Like, you know, when you like put on like a power suit and you're like wearing a mech and then you're like more powerful, like there's just a lot of technology that can kind of help you be able to do more. So I would suggest um, embracing it. Haven't seen anything that would replace anybody yet, but who knows? <laughs> I agree with that. And there, there, there's a ton of interest in the AI tools and technology from the younger generations too. Uh, we're actually offering uh, pre-university courses now for high school students in uh, STEM courses, and we're offering them through UBC and through UFT. Um, so if anybody in the in the crowd has anybody, if they know of anybody between, I think it's 13 to 17 or 13 to 18, um, who's interested in that, just, just reach out and let us know. But um, the highest interest in our courses that we've seen so far is in the AI tech and the tools used in AI, which is, is really interesting. So I um, think we're going to see a lot of it, but not uh, not replacing jobs, like you said, anytime soon, hopefully. So they still can't uh, form form hands properly. So we've still got a while to go, I think. <laughs> um what coding languages do you use? Uh, what's a good one to learn? Python? <laughs> Wait, That's a good question. We, we use C Sharp in a lot of ours. Uh, oh. This here too, so. Nice, I did a little bit of C Sharp when I was at the foreign currency exchange place. I actually really, really enjoyed C Sharp quite a lot. Um, right now I use um, Go, Python, and I've recently been using Kotlin which is like a kind of like advanced, an advancement on Java, but I've never actually used Java before. So that's a whole learning curve. Um, as far as what a good one is to learn, uh, I would say yes to Python because you can do a lot. Um, you can do a lot very quickly. And also I think that for some reason, Python is like just a very supportive community for people learning stuff. So there's like a lot of content that's very like accessible, I think for like learning how to do things in Python. And you could use it to do like, Anything that you would want to, like you want to try some AI thing or you want to try like making your own web scraper, like you can do that in Python quite easily without a lot of, without having to really um, know a lot. On the other hand though, 
what I would recommend is um, I actually like I, I pretty strongly feel that you would be best set up for success if you can learn the controversial statement C, C, um, Linux fundamentals and networking, like those three things. If you have like a pretty, it doesn't even have to be like a deep understanding, but if you kind of like know how those things plug together, like those are things that I find myself not necessarily using on a daily basis, but every once in a while, just kind of having to fall back to where it's like, you're trying to reason about what's happening and knowing what could be happening a couple levels deeper is just really useful. And I think makes it much easier to be able to switch between things later because it's pretty much all built on the same stuff. So C is just a language that kind of forces you to have to know a little bit more about like handling memory and sort of like what's going on. Um, and then Linux, because so many systems are built on Linux and then networking, because that's how you do things where you have more than one computer involved. Um, but yeah, Python certainly for just like, it's great for learning, they get you up and running. You can do a lot with it. I use it a lot constantly, even though I'm not actually like writing, like actually when I worked at, in games, we did all of our server programming in Python, which is a weird choice, honestly. Um, but I still I still use it a lot for like, it's just my go-to language for like, I wanna do something quickly. Um, and, uh, just a quick follow-up for you there, Christy. Would you say, I, I've heard this from other people, so I'm, I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, but if, would you say once you've learned um, one base coding language, is it easier to then learn other languages afterwards? Yes, definitely, yeah. Because they all pretty much are doing the same things fundamentally. It's just like different um, different like syntax you're using for the same things. But again, if, you did, if C was your one language, that would better set you up for any of these other languages because some of them will pull in some weird like memory management thing that maybe you've never encountered before. But if you're... If you know some C, then it won't be so um, won't be so strange. I guess there's also functional languages too, though. I'm not even including those, and I've never worked with functional languages except almost Erlang once. Um, that's kind of like a whole other. I guess it's kind of like genres of languages. If you learn one in each genre, then you're then you can do anything. Yeah, that's well because we we teach with C sharp, and a lot of uh, students will ask us about C plus plus as well. Um, and we we teach a lot of times using uh, Unity as a developer, and and people will ask for Unreal. We use Unreal in our, our design game design course too. But um, yeah, that's that's just something that comes up uh, quite often. If you know, if, if I know C sharp, would it be easier for me to to then be able to learn C plus plus? And it, it absolutely it would be. Um, we just you know basically it's ha having the, the base foundations of of the coding language, like you said. And if you if you do one, if you root it in C, you're probably going to be pretty safe for for most things. So. <laughs> So, um, and Robert said, thank you, I think in the chat there. Um, thank you for answering. Yeah, of course, Robert, uh, feel free to add any other questions in there. Um, and then how do you apply for companies in BC, Vancouver in general to get a, a call for interviews? Um, how do you job search? Uh, any tips are appreciated. So, I mean, we we offer career support as a part of the actual bootcamp itself. So we have a team that would help our students specifically kind of build your resumes. Um, I think they have a process for, you know, a number of companies that you would kind of reach out to per week as you're going through the process of looking for opportunities. So um, there's just different things there. But uh, maybe, uh, Christy, you could kind of give some advice from your standpoint. Um, just I think you probably touched on it earlier in your presentation, but uh, any general advice for people to to get uh, called for interviews? <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's really hard. I, I I found my first position was super tough. And then after that, everything got easier because I already had the first position to point at and also because I had uh, more of a network to reach out to, like people I'd worked with before. So I guess my, I think my tips would be to network, I guess, even though it's kind of like a, I don't know. For me personally, networking is not, when I think of like, I'm gonna go network, that doesn't sound fun at all. But I think there are a lot of like, there are a lot of like meetups and that kind of thing where it would be good places to go if you're, there's something that you're interested in. You can meet other people who are working in that field. And then just being able to know people it just as a way to like get your resume in, I think can really help. Um, so personally, and also a lot of meetups are virtual now too. So that really helps. Um, yeah, I think that like networking and meeting people would be my recommendation. And there's probably, I mean, that's a great, that's great advice. Um, you know, you worked in gaming previously too. So even if you went through a course like this um, for software development, um, join some game jams, like do some online things that way and, and work with some other developers and designers and kind of learn how that that works on that side as well. So um, yeah, networking overall is is how most people get opportunities. So as far as I know, most people get hired for opportunities based on people they know um, after you've networked. So, I mean, you have to have the skill set and the education, but if two people go in for the same job and one's best friends with the owner, he's probably going to end up with the job. So. Yes. I mean, the other thing that I would mention too is like an, one like something that I've, 
I've learned and gotten better at over time is just to like not be afraid of reaching out to people and getting like rejected. Cause like, so I think on the one hand, pursue like meeting people and making connections, but on the other hand, like just apply for the job. And like the worst thing that happens is it just gets ignored. Like it's not really, I mean, unless you wrote something really mean in, in like your cover letter, like it's not going to hurt you. And like, if you see somebody or meet them, like you might as well reach out and ask them the worst thing that they can say is no. And I, I think that's something I've learned is just like that, that muscle of like getting used to like people ignoring your email or getting rejected. Like it's fine because you, you will succeed at some point as long as you're actually like trying and putting yourself out there. Totally. Yeah. And you know, to back, uh, backpack on that too, sometimes we actually tell people or tell students, um, if you have a, a company that you really want to work for and they have nothing um, posted right now, apply anyway, reach out, send an email to somebody in the company and let them know that you're interested. Even if they don't have something available now, you're now on the radar. They might think of you in a few months and reach back out to you with an opportunity. So, which again, just goes back to networking and, and human connection, which, which always makes sense. So, um, how prevalent are remote positions? Um, would I need to move somewhere like Vancouver to get hired, uh, in a reasonable position? I know you touched on this before, but uh, I'll let you touch on this entirely because you have way more experience there than I do. Sure. Um, I guess it depends on the company. Like there are some companies, I think also after COVID, a lot of companies have decided that they don't want to bother paying for office space. And in those cases, those companies, I think have just have, they have no particular physical location. So uh, they're open to people from wherever, as long as they can meet the like the visa and legal requirements to hire somebody, because that can be complicated for a company to actually employ people in. Um, other countries where they have no experience. So I guess I would say, I think that they're fairly prevalent. I could definitely see it being harder to get a remote position for your first job though. Cause I think that that's one thing where like when people are just starting out, I think I would also, I'm biased though. Like when I had my first job, I was in an office. So this is all from that biased perspective, but it was very valuable to be near people and be able to just walk over to them and talk to them and ask for help versus if like I, I have quite, a, I'm remote now and I have quite a bit of time just to myself. So if I need somebody to help me with something, I have to make time with them and schedule it and then like join a meeting and do it. So I guess, I, I think I would probably, I would be, if you are going to have a remote position for your first job, I think I would ask a lot of questions about the kinds of support that you'll have and how you'll be able to reach out to people. And if people are available in your time zone to talk to and all of that kind of thing. I think there are a lot of remote positions out there. It just depends on the kinds of companies you're looking at. So I would I would just look at the look at the companies and look at what they're um, what postings they're listing. I just think my experience is also a lot with open source. So I'm thinking of companies like Red Hat and IBM, which are pretty huge companies and have a lot of positions and hire people all over the place. Um, so I think that there are a lot of opportunities. I would be careful though with your first job just to make sure you get the support you need. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense actually because uh, I've worked in both remote and um, obviously in in person and in, in office roles and. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little, you feel a little bit less connected. Sometimes you do have to really, you know, carve out the time and set meetings with people versus just casually bumping into them at lunch and asking them something about what, what you're working on or, you know, whatever the case may be. So, um, yeah, there's opportunities there, but I, I completely uh, mirror that. Uh, just, you know, always be careful with your first one and make sure that you're getting the support you need. So, um, are there prerequisites to applying for the bootcamp and what is the selection process like? Um, there aren't any prerequisites. The bootcamp is considered beginner friendly. Um, so you can, you would go through and send the application through our education team would review the application, make sure that you're, um, you know, a good candidate for the course, but most people would be because it's, it's beginner friendly. So, um, you don't have to have any, any prerequisites for it. You don't have to have any former knowledge. Now, if you do have experience in coding, it's, it's always going to benefit you. Um, cause there's a huge component of coding, uh, through this bootcamp, of course, but, um, so that would be something, you know, if you wanted to partially prepare yourself for, for a course like this, feel free to try and uh, immerse yourself in, in the world of coding a little bit on your own before you get into it, see what you can, you can do. Um, but yeah, there's no, there's no prerequisites for it. It would just be uh, based on uh, availability because it's all beginner friendly. So, and then what can you tell us about the um, background of the bootcamp instructors? Ooh, let me, um, Shamir, we, we have uh, the information. Oh, geez. I don't want to, I don't want to say this wrong. They just, I was just talking about this with the company and uh, who the instructors are for um, these courses. And we've got some great instructors there, but I don't want to mix up the companies and say somebody from the wrong company <laughs> that's teaching the other course because we've got like product management and software development. And we've got um, some instructors from some great companies for both. So the best thing I'd say, Shamir, is reach out to the team here and we can provide information. Uh, we will have specific information on the instructors as well uh, posted on the, the website shortly. Um, I think we're going to do some ask me anything sessions with these instructors too. So, um, like 
we're doing instructor or asking anything session right now, kind of with uh, Christy and an expert in the industry, which is amazing. Um, but we'll probably mirror this type of presentation in the next month or two with the actual instructors themselves and allow students to, or, you know, potential students to kind of ask and, and grill them and learn about their, their uh, history and, and what they're going to be doing with the course there. So uh, Shamir, if you want to learn more about that, or if you want to be involved in that, uh, ask me anything session, uh, just reach out to us, reach out to admissions at circuitstream.com. And uh, we can definitely point you in the right direction and provide more, more details on the instructors. But I'm, I'm only not providing it because I don't want to mix up the companies, but there's some great instructors from some awesome companies coming through here. So um, I'm going to close that one. Uh, can you share the career outcome of the previously graduated cohorts? So this, the software development is a newer course for us through UBC. Um, so the cohorts that are, are going through right now, we will have graduates soon that we'll be, be able to bring up and share information um, from their experience in the courses. But uh, this is a newer course that's available through UBC. So we don't have uh, the same pool of graduates we do for say like our game de design bootcamp or game development bootcamp or uh, some of the other uh, boot camps that have just been around for you know a couple of years whereas this one's a little bit newer. So um, I can provide more more information there as we get it. But the best thing I'd say uh, uh, that is just uh, that just reach out to the team here and uh, let us know admissions at circuitstream.com. We can always share more, more details uh, with you as, as they come through for that. Um, and then, sorry, join late. Uh, Christy, what was your row with education? Oh yeah, this um, you had your slide up there earlier at the very beginning. Um, oh, sure, I can just, I can summarize though. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically, I, I went to I went to BCIT and I did the, the two year diploma program called CST, and then I worked and then and then I went back and did their um, I don't know what it's called. It's called Bachelor of Technology program, but now they call it something else. It's like Bachelor of Applied Computer Science or so their, their, their degree program. And I worked, I did that for a year and then um, I started a job and I finished the rest uh, as like um, part-time. Um, and basically my journey to Google was that I had about nine years of experience at other companies before I started at Google. And um, it, was also, it was funny because the level that I got hired at at Google was fairly low actually, <laughs> which I've heard is not an experience unique to me, but that people often are under leveled when they're hired. But basically I got let, hired at the level that was like kind of just after new grad. There's like the new grad level. And then I was like, just after that. So it was kind of funny. It was like, but that also leads me to this, this opinion that I have that like, it's very doable to get a job at Google. And I, I like how they have so much, they've made the interview process so consistent again, with like lots of caveats that people's biases are still in there for sure. But it's consistent enough that like, I think that if you can get past the, those algorithmic questions, like I think a lot, like lots of people have a good chance of getting like a good position and then being able to like, I was able to, I've been able to be promoted a, a t twice since my time at Google and like it's worked out pretty well for me, but it was kind of like this sort of like level bar to get in. Like I had nine years of experience, but that didn't really matter as long as I could answer the correct uh, algorithms question. Uh, but yeah, that was my, my route to Google. Awesome, awesome. And then this um, this presentation, uh, Rajveer, is all recorded as well. And just because you've registered, you should receive a full recording in your inbox um, after the event's finished. So go back and uh, check out Christy's um, uh, actual presentation part there. She actually has a slide kind of showing her journey on, on that part too. So um, are the other stats on employment rate of students um, passing? I'm, uh, I'm assuming not passing out. Um, <laughs> um, employment rate of students passing. Uh, we do have them for the the courses, obviously, that we've had in place a little bit longer, and, and we will have that for this one, uh, some, same way that we do for our, our game development boot camp and our game design boot camps and the other ones that are available through UBC. Um, so we don't we don't have those stats now, just because it is a newer course that's available through the university. Uh, but we will, and as uh, soon as we do, uh, we will share that with you as well. But um, we do have the stats from similar boot camps through UBC. So if, if you wanted to connect with the admissions team and ask them uh, like what the outcomes are for our, our game development students or our game design students, they can provide the, those details for you. And um, they won't be exactly you know the same as this because it's not the exact same thing, but it would give you a good indication of what the career support would offer for the students. And I know that the outcome rates are very high. So um, is this boot camp helpful for a person like me who has no experience in IT or, um, any other uh, computer science, basically for a beginner with basic computer experience. 
Uh, yes. I mean, uh, the boot camp is considered beginner friendly, but it will tackle pretty advanced concepts as you go through. So the best thing I would say is take a good look through the syllabus, like go to that link that I provided earlier, uh, have a look through the course syllabus, um, just know what you're going to be getting yourself into in terms of what you're going to be learning over the, the, the full course of the boot camp. Um, but just know that you don't have to have any prior experience. So it, it is beginner friendly. Um, it'll start off with kind of the base foundations. Um, so if, you know, for somebody coming in, if they have a bit of um, coding experience, the first couple of weeks, will probably be a little bit of a refresher for them. They might, you know, see some things that they've done previously, but if you're completely new and you've never done coding, um, this is completely new for you. That's, that's what the bootcamp's made for. It's, it's made for you to uh, learn all of the foundational skills from the ground up. Um, but just know it is a bootcamp, it's fast paced. So you also have to be prepared for that environment. You have to be able to kind of keep up with things and move through things at, uh, at a pretty, quick speed as you go through the course versus, you know, a two or four year program sort of thing. So and the goal of a boot camp is to try and prepare people as closely as possible or as similarly as you can for somebody who's taken like a two or four year course. So um, it, it definitely goes through things uh, fast paced for sure. So uh, for the final projects, are students working uh, with an actual company? Um, I believe we work we don't actually work with the company in terms of us working on a project for the company, but we work with companies to come up with uh, real world problems and, um, you know, real life scenarios that they would actually need um, sorted out. Uh, and oftentimes, especially in the gaming side too, they can't really provide us with things that they need because there's so much confidential confidentiality that's uh, going on in the coding and developing side of video games and things. But um, for software development overall, um, we would work with companies and, and come up with different types of problems for the, the final projects, but it wouldn't be something that you'd actually be doing for the company itself, if that makes sense. And then, well, this could be for both of us here. What would your uh, top three tips for networking be? I think you should go first though, because I want to know what the tips are. Sure, also. sure. <laughs> yeah, my my top tips are um, immersing yourself. So, you know, if there's physical opportunity, like if you're able to go to any sort of conferences um, that are tackling these sorts of concepts and you can get to a conference, um, and even if sometimes conferences are expensive, there's there's often opportunities to volunteer at conferences. You can put your name in the hat and you receive kind of um, a free pass, if you will, to the conference. You still have to play, pay for your plane and for your, your hotel, but um, conference tickets themselves can be thousands of dollars sometimes, but they're really cool opportunities for you to network with other people. So if you can get yourself into one of those, that's a really good way to do it. Um, anything online, um, like I was mentioning before, you know, finding uh, online events, finding game jams, um, anywhere where you're going to kind of be put into a group of other developers where you can kind of bounce information off of them um, and grow your network that way, that's that's huge. And then, um, and honestly, another thing that I would say is through your education, no matter where you're going through education, if it's through university, if it's through college, if it's through um, a, a company like us through, well, I guess we're technically through the university too, but um, just utilize that network of people. Like we, we bring people into our network, our uh, Discord network, as soon as they become students and we never boot them out. Um, so once you've completed the course, we kind of want those pool of graduates there to support new students as they're coming through. Um, we want them to collaborate and be able to work together on projects to problem solve, you know, um, so th those are probably my biggest, my biggest suggestions in terms of networking is, um, through your education and then just trying to get yourself out there as, as much as you can. That wasn't three tips. I only gave two there, but, um, did you have anything else to add? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, networking is really hard. I guess, I think it helps if you don't think of it as like networking, it's just like meeting people and talking to people and try to keep it like pretty low stakes. And I think that like doing it frequently if you can and like because if you do it like one time there's like one meetup you're going to and you're really focused you could like maybe <laughs> might not work out you might also kind of like come on you don't want to like walk up to the first person you see and be like well you take my resume like that's not gonna you just want to meet people and get to know them and like I don't know keep track of I guess keep track of when you hear like ask people where they work and then like uh, try to keep track of the companies you hear about and look into them and if they look interesting like try to reach out to those people again um and also, I do think like meetups are a good, are a really good way to meet people, meetups and conferences, just anything where people come together and they kind of are coming together for that purpose, really, to meet other people and to talk to them about stuff. So those are great opportunities to like get a sense of, especially if you want to work in a particular, like if you're, if you're in Vancouver, there are a lot of those sorts of, there's also some interesting conferences in Vancouver that are like a little bit smaller if you look into it. And then like the, the, the number of software developers isn't like, there are a lot of positions, but there's, you'll see the same people at these things if you go to them. So you do kind of get a sense of like what jobs there are in the area. Um, 
but yeah, I think like, don't, don't like, I think I would go into it intentionally, like talk to somebody. Don't just, I tend to get stuck. I'll like go and talk to one person and then I just want to stay there. And I don't really want to like go mingle and talk to anyone else, but try to like force yourself to talk to other people, but just, it's just meeting people and getting to know them. Like, don't try to make it like super high stakes. Um, yeah. Put yourself out there, talk to people, talk to more than one person and then just follow up on things that sound interesting and, and don't be afraid of being rejected because it's, it's actually not that bad. You, you'll survive. And the more rejections you get, that's just all like a foundation for when you get, when you succeed later. Totally. And if you're a little bit more nervous, like if, you know, if it was somebody like you that, you know, you kind of talk to one person in the corner and then it's, you have to get, like, get yourself there's, there's, I find that online networking kind of allows you to get over that hurdle a little bit. And there's a ton of discord communities too, especially developer communities. So, um, you know, look for companies, um, just look for different opportunities, like look, just search discord communities, discord developer communities, and, and throw in some keywords for some different companies that you're interested in or locations that you're interested in, or, you know, whatever the case may be. And you'll find opportunities that way too. And most, most discord servers, like in that sense, a lot of them, you can just, um, request to join and then you're part of the server and you can instantly start networking with lots of people. Uh, our servers, our discord networks are for the students, obviously. So once they come through, we want all of our students to have a kind of a, a private student network that way. Um, but there's, there's a ton of opportunities to find online networking. So you don't have to feel like you're, you know, physically putting yourself out there as much to go chat with people around. And I get that too. I mean, I, I, I'm, I can go talk to anybody some days and then other days, uh, I find myself at a, a conference and, you know, it takes you a little bit more to, to get past that first combo and, and go engage with 20 other people. So, but it's, uh, it's definitely beneficial. So. Um, I would add one more thing, which is uh, oh, maybe sure, yeah. like like hit or miss, but open source development is an interest is an interesting place to network because it can potentially just kind of take a lot of your time and be frustrating. But also, if you find if you find a project where there's enough people that are working on it and they're and it's a good community, then people are actually pretty invested in like helping each other, and they'll often have like like could be Discord or Slack or some kind of community that you can join and chat with people and people will be much more likely to help you. Like if I've, if I've encountered somebody because they fixed a bug and then they start talking to me about like a job opportunity or something then I'm going to be much more inclined to pass their resume along, or at least try to connect them with something that'll be helpful. Um, and, oh, and you can also ask people for help with like practice interviews too. That is another thing. Like that's something that when I go to things and like, I can't necessarily help you get hired at Google, but I can connect you to other people at Google who will give you a practice interview or a run through to like try things out. So that's something you can ask for as well. That's, that's huge. Actually, practicing interview skills is, is massive. And in the process, you end up kind of connecting with more people too that way. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, invaluable skills to have. So, um, so let's see, we've got four more questions up here right now. Um, does circuit stream offer any scholarships or bursaries? Um, we don't have any set scholarships in place, but we do offer scholarships from time to time. Uh, mostly in partnerships with companies, if companies are, are offering some scholarship seats for some of our courses. So uh, every once in a while, things like that will come up. Um, but more so it would just be, um, you know, if you were looking to take the course um, and you were looking for uh, different ways to do the payment, we do have the, the payment plan options there for you too. So, um, and of course, we, we have the uh, event promotions uh, in place sometimes when we do these, which we have 10% uh, off right now too. So um, yeah, if you have any questions about that, uh, Stefano, about um, the opportunities or kind of what like a payment schedule would look like for the course, um, just reach out to admissions at circuitstream.com and uh, they can give you all the answers um, with that there too. So, uh, and also if they, if we end up having any uh, scholarship opportunities that come up for future cohorts or anything like that, um, they can, they can reach out and let you know that info too. So just admissions at circuitstream.com. Um, do the boot camps offer university credit with UBC? Um, if not, what circuit certificates the circuit stream offer once you have finished the boot camp? Um, so it's not it's not a credit course uh, through the university. It's through the university um, uh, EXL, UBC EXL Extended Learning Department. So it's uh, basically you would get a co-branded um, badge once you complete the course um, as a software developer, and it would have the UBC, uh, branding on it as well. So you can take the courses directly through a lot of our courses. You can take directly through circuit stream, but in doing it through the university, you just get the, the branding and the, the support from the university as well. So when you show people that you've completed the course, um, you can, obviously you've completed it through circuit stream, but show the badge that it's uh, a UBC branded bootcamp as well. So, um, hopefully that answers. If you have any more questions about that one too, uh, just reach out and let us know. We can, we can uh, answer that for you. 
Uh, do you have any tips for passing um, algorithmic questions? Anything that yeah, I can see you on you unmuted. This is for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I guess a, a few thoughts. You've probably you may have heard this book, but cracking the coding interview is probably like the best book for pre preparing for these kinds of interviews. Um, it just has like it, it has kind of like uh, sections where it shows you typical types of things that you might be asked, and then it has example questions, and then walks you through the solution. Um, what I actually did that really helped me was I was lucky that I had a few friends who were also interested in the same sort of thing. So we had a thing where we were doing algorithms club after work <laughs> at the company we worked at, which is maybe a questionable um, suggestion, but we, we'd all practice together. So we take turns, like actually standing in front of each other and trying to whiteboard out the answers, which was horrible. It was so embarrassing. There were times where I would just stop partway through and just be like, I cannot continue. This is too embarrassing with like my friends watching me like struggle with this interview question. But it really helped me because it's just such a different experience actually talking things out. So I'd recommend cracking the coding interview. I'd recommend if you have anybody who is also interested in that sort of thing, just practicing with them, just like going through the motions of, of actually talking the thing through makes a big difference. Um, there's also something called Advent of Code. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's this like, it's like, a, it's like a Christmas Advent puzzle thing that happens every year in December where there's like 25, 24 coding problems. You do like one each day. And I really like it. It's really fun. And like they're, some of them are extremely easy. And then every once in a while, one of them will be like, like few of them will be very difficult. And it'll actually like really take a lot to solve them. But that can be a fun way to practice. Actually doing that is part of what also gave me the confidence to apply at Google because I was able I was able to solve them and I was like, well, maybe I can do this. I can't, I can't believe I could actually do this. That's um, fun. I like that. And then lastly, I, I don't know if I don't know if it's still as good as it I actually paid for a company called Interview Cake. It's a website that you can go to where they like walk you through like a series of problems. And like I would just do one of those each day in the morning to like test and I would try to like write out the my answer on paper and I try to like think about think it through be like where can I find problems with this before I actually type it because on the subject of coding and dopamine it's very easy to just type something in and be like does it work does it work does it work but actually like taking some time to try to reason through it and find the issues and fix them before you submit it um yeah but it, again it's very doable it just takes it just takes a lot of practice but fortunately also I don't think you don't have to do the like really hard stuff usually like people don't expect you to be able to like some like very difficult algorithm that only expert people can usually implement correctly anyway. Like nobody's going to ask you to do that. It really is a lot of just like use the right data structure, be able to reason through, be able to spot problems, that kind of thing. I love the advent one. That's that's hilarious to me. It's such a fun way to incorporate, you know, a, a learning learning style for yourself, I guess. But that's really fun. Um, is this bootcamp available for international foreign? Um, are there pricing differences between domestic and international student? Um, that's a great question. I know this is available through UBC, but I, I'm fairly certain it is available for anybody um, globally. Um, if there is a limitation on students from within Canada, I do apologize. I, I don't want to provide you with any in, inaccurate information during the session here. Um, I think the best thing to do would be to reach out to the admissions team and get the direct information there to see uh, what the pricing would look like and if there's um, any sort of um, you know, occurrences we should be aware of if, if somebody's applying for the course and they're um, international coming. But I don't think we would have any issues there. I, I know that we certainly have, like we, we offer courses through like the University of Melbourne, for example, in, in Australia as well. So uh, we have students all around the world. I would just have to see if, uh, if you would be able to access the course that's available directly through UBC as an international student. Um, so yeah, just, just reach out to admissions at circuitstream.com. Um, just shoot them a quick email. You can just ask one sentence and just say, I'm an international student. I'm curious about the software development bootcamp um, in terms of pricing and availability. Um, and they'll, they'll give you all the details for that. So um, ho hopefully that helped uh, answer the question. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't have a direct answer for you on that one there. Um, and is there a list of apps you would suggest a student have installed prior to taking the bootcamp? Um, uh, Des Dev packages. That's... Uh, I don't want to answer that one directly because I don't know. I, I know, you know, if you go through the uh, syllabus and you take a look at some of the tools that are used, uh, you can always, you know, download some of those in advance and have those tools kind of ready to go. Um, but I mean, just as a general um, developer, uh, Chrissy, do you have any suggestions there of, of anything? Um, I mean, I know you wouldn't know specific to our bootcamp per se, but just is there anything that they could kind of do in advance to prepare themselves as a general software developer? Um. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know what's in the boot camp, but just a couple of things that come to mind. Also relevant, I saw somebody ask a question in the chat about whether Eclipse is still widely used. And I was just typing up this long answer where like, mostly I don't know, 
But uh, something that people do use a lot of is VS Code. Um, it's a very popular IDE and has a lot of plugins for, for all kinds of languages. And so I see that all the time everywhere and lots of things that are even built on it that I've worked on. So VS Code is probably worth installing and playing around with. Um, I, I mean, it also having, having a GitHub account is useful um, because if you do want to do something open source or you do want to build something and put it out there, um, it also, I mean, it also does make a big difference if you have any code actually on there when you're going for a job, if you can point people at your, of course you want to make sure it's code that you actually want people to see. Um, but yeah, so I don't know if that, but like, yeah, Python, but I guess going back to the previous question, like Python is a great language for just trying things out. So it wouldn't hurt you to like install VS code and try to do some, try doing some Python development. Um, you could get it, make a GitHub account. I don't know if you want to put anything up on there yet, uh, but you can always take it down. So. Totally. Yeah. And then, and then just in, in addition to that, just look through the syllabus and look at some of the tools that you're going to be using in, in the course. And um, yeah, you can download some of those in advance. You can, you know, familiarize yourself with some of it, but um, yeah, that's probably the, the best advice um, that I can give from my standpoint there. Um, but if you click the link and, and check out the course syllabus, it'll definitely give you a better, better idea of what you'll be tackling during the, the course. So, and so I'm going to whip over to the, that's the end of the questions there. I'm just going to take a quick look in the uh, chat here transparency i've had the questions tab open and i haven't been able to see everything in the chat here for a little bit um there's the question on eclipse um oh robert had to drop out thank you for attending robert if you get this uh, recording afterwards thank you for your questions um free apps i'm just having a quick look through yeah i think that's it i think that's all that we had there so um so first off thank you so much christy for uh attending the session here today and providing the information um i can always provide course information and you know industry insights but um, it's a whole different level when you have somebody coming in that is actually a professional working in the industry who can provide uh, knowledge and advice for people that I, I could never do. So, so thank you so much for coming in and, and for sharing that with everybody today. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, of course, of course. And um, I'll probably invite you back for future sessions too, if that's okay. This sure. was amazing. So, um, so if anybody has any uh, other questions for Christy, I think she put her uh, LinkedIn um, up in the the oh. uh, chat there earlier. So. Um, feel free to uh, to reach out to her. My LinkedIn, I don't have the link here, but my, it's just Tyler Trapp uh, Circuit Stream. If you just if you search those keywords, my LinkedIn should be the only one that pops up at the top. So feel free to add me that way um, and look for our future sessions. Um, just look, you can look on the UBC Excel website or you can look at uh, Circuit Stream and see we'll have future sessions coming up too. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you to Christy. Uh, we went a little bit over time here today. Um, oh, geez, it's 2.40 already my time. Wow, we really, we got chatting here. But, um, but yes, thank you to everybody. Um, we will see you mm -hmm. at the, the next session that we have. And uh, we hope that uh, everybody has a fantastic day. So cheers. Bye, everybody. Bye.